They called it the Warminster Thing. I saw this thing go over, what they call the thing, you know, and it was exactly like a railway carriage, you know, lit up. And it started up overhead there, and I saw it and watched it right out of sight, right over the hills. But I looked in that direction, there was a silver plane and a pink one, like a, between a pink and a red cerise colour then right side by side and they were in that direction and there was no clay but I don't know where it went to. I heard this noise, this hell of a noise it was and um, it came down you know it was a bit misty, foggy and uh, well, it, was, it was like as if uh, tin can was floating with nuts and bolts you know and somebody was rattling it. What I did see was a green shimmering light for about a quarter of an hour. Well it's hard to explain, it's like a bright light with a red light in the middle. Like a cigar shape, glowing at each end. I saw something over there between those two bungalows, and to me, it looked as if it was about 500 feet high. No higher. It seemed to be hovering. It resembled something like a comet, but comets are white, so uh, this one was orange, oval colour, so it certainly wasn't a comet. There very well might be something in the stratosphere. I mean, we're sending spaceships to other planets, and I can't see any reason why, if there is life on another planet, they shouldn't be sending a uh, craft to us. Obviously, these things, whatever they are, are infinitely maneuverable. They're certainly beyond our ability to catch. We can't put salt on their tails as it were. Tell me what you saw. Just an object in the sky. And what did it look like? Like a saucer. Yes, and were there any lights or anything around No, it's it? just a white object in the sky. We were busy in here, but we had to come back in. But the three soldiers that were there with us, they also saw it. And they described it more or less like a lampshade. Well, although I've seen it, it hasn't convinced me. I, I still don't think there's anything in it myself. I think it's just a load of tripe. That's all. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of people were convinced that creatures from outer space had arrived. Excitement grew to fear. So much so that on August the 27th, 1965, the council chairman took the extraordinary step of calling a public meeting. The town hall was besieged and the Warminster legend had begun. I have never seen anything like it that Friday evening. It was fantastic. The people in the town, the reporters, all the dailies. My phone didn't stop ringing. We had them knocking at the doors. I've never seen anything like it. The only thing I could do, on the Monday morning I went on holiday to get away from it. It started off Christmas Eve 1964, um, which we published. A very respected member of Warminster, it was the postmaster actually, he reckoned he had strange noises on Christmas Eve, rattling on the roof, no known calls. And really, I suppose that's what started it, and from then it snowballed. Reports multiplied, eerie shapes, ghostly lights in the sky, and more than anything, that awful, terrifying noise. From all over the world, the watchers came, scanning the skies from the hilltops round this Wiltshire market town. In four months, 400 sightings had been reported. In the pubs and in the shops, the talk was of little else but the thing and generations of television reporters were to cut their teeth on the mystery. And this Wiltshire town is back in the news again because yet another attempt is now being made to identify the Warminster thing. Now the Warminster thing, as some people already know, is the term given to mysterious objects which have been seen in the sky around these parts. And this latest investigation, the most comprehensive yet, is being undertaken by an organization called Bufora. Now that stands for the British Unidentified Flying Object Research Association. It seemed incredible, but in Warminster, excitement was at fever pitch. Surely, they argued, the sheer weight of evidence meant that something was going on. We have no doubt whatsoever that the phenomena at Warminster, the sounds and the sights are connected with and caused by flying saucers. And therefore, of course, it is our business and we are investigating and have been since the phenomena were widely reported. Now the all-important question, does this thing really exist or is it just a joke? Well, it exists undoubtedly. 
we have very a very wide uh, range of testimonies from people of all walks of life uh, attesting to that fact. Uh, the sights and sounds around here leave no doubt that what we're dealing with is a flying saucer or its flying saucers. And of course, is it that the existence of those is, I think, unquestionable. Would you say that we face any danger from these flying saucers? I would say it can't be ruled out. So far, of course, there have been, there have been no uh, overt acts of hostility which can definitely be established to be such. There are some disturbing incidents, but of course it's possible that another interpretation ought to be put upon these things. I don't think we need to uh, be afraid to go to bed tonight, but uh, one never knows, of course, in the long run. But, real or imagined, Warminster was in ferment. Indeed it was. Activity was centred on the two great hills outside the town. Reports, seemingly reliable, spoke of whole flocks of pigeons struck dead in mid-flight. Soil samples from key areas turned up the remains of moles and mice, their bodies riddled with tiny holes. It was the greatest story the Little Warminster Journal ever had. It had all begun quietly enough at Christmas. Tucked away beneath their New Year calendar was a report of a noise, unearthly and terrifying. Suddenly, the silence was broken by a crackling sound emanating from the Bell Hill direction. At first, she thought that it was simply a lorry unloading on the hill. But it passed over her head and became louder and louder. Letters began to arrive, more reports followed. But even then, the story was almost hidden below the births, marriages and deaths, the farming reports and the adverts. That menacing, vibrating noise has been heard again in Warminster. The shock waves of sound, which can kill and maim birds, and stun the senses of rational people. Finally, belatedly, it made the headline. And after that, and for the next ten years or more, stories about creatures from other planets became part of the staple diet in the newspaper columns. Barely two days after the public meeting held in Warminster Town Hall to discuss and try to identify the thing, it has been seen by at least five people over the bank holiday period. Whether you believed it all or not, the stories of the experiences of the people of Warminster became ever more gripping. He was shaking in every limb when he staggered indoors. His family were most concerned, but it was some time before he told them of his peculiar experience on that walk through the darkness. He saw nothing. It was a noise that made the strong lad's knees knock. The same weird crackling sound. People were rushing here from all parts of the country who were interested in UFOs. Um, we hadn't heard much about it until then, but uh, we had a number of callers at the office wanting to know what was going on, and they were going up on the plane and spotting at night and staying up there all night. Well, by the time they'd been up there in the dark and looking at the sky, <laughs> I think they saw a lot more than was really there. Obviously, some people really thought they saw something, and, but I'm sure that everybody who's been out and looked at the stars, that by the time you've stood gazing at them for 10 minutes, they all appear to be moving about. But one photographer, Mr. Gordon Faulkner, had better luck. He managed to take a picture of a flying saucer that hit the British press in a big way and then went round the world. Mr. Faulkner, in fact, has done much to put Warminster on the flying saucer map. This is how he got his picture. I had a camera with me. I was taking it down to my sister who wanted to borrow it. And, uh, well, as I say, I just had the camera with me. And it was pure luck, I just undid it and took a picture. The object was staying still all this time, was it? Or was it no, moving? No, it was moving. But moving slowly? It was moving fairly fast. I wouldn't like to say how fast, but I couldn't say how fast. Now, some people have said that when they try to take a picture of one of these things, there's been some mysterious force or radiation that stopped the camera from working. Did you find this? It didn't stop my camera from working. Have you had people say that this picture is a fake? Mm, of course I have, yes. I mean... What do you say to them when they say that? They're entitled to their own opinion. I know it's not a fake. And it doesn't really bother me what other people think. Some people, nonetheless, are distinctly bothered. Colonel Allen, for instance. Well, I think the whole thing's a lot of nonsense. Why do you say that? Well, to begin with, there isn't a single authenticated uh, sighting by somebody who's, shall we say, in qualified uh, to uh, give an impartial scientific assessment of the sighting. 
Now, you believe, I think, that it's possible to fake photographs of these objects fairly easily. In fact, you've done it yourself. Yes. How have you done this? Yes. Well, I had one colour film left on a, on a, a, a reel, and uh, so I produced, uh, I produced this. And this is um, exactly what? Well, the, the flying object was actually drawn on a piece of paper and uh, cut out in outline and then photographed against a blue bath towel on the ground whilst I stood on a stepladder leaning against the wall of the house. And I moved the camera slightly as I took the photograph so as to blur the thing. And what are the reactions of the believers to this photograph? Have you shown it to anyone? Well, no, I, I've kept it fairly quiet because I had intended originally to bring it out uh, whilst admitting it was a fake. Uh, next time the thing blew up, as I'm sure it will do. In fact, it is doing now. <laughs> Number 42 Chapel Street, Warminster, is out of this world. It's Britain's first satellite station for tracking unidentified flying objects. Using binoculars and a high-powered telescope, the UFO brigade are mixing up a storm in the Wiltshire heavens, looking for close encounters of the third kind. Well, I was in the army at the time, and it was way back in 64, and uh, myself and two friends were down the local park, just over the road there, and... Uh, we saw these people looking into the sky, and lo and behold, there was a UFO. Well, I think it was a UFO. It was a cigar-shaped, you know, the typical grey cigar-shaped, and it hovered for about 20 minutes over the church, and that was over the actual town. It's from this vantage point on Cradle Hill, high over Warminster, that the British UFO Society are hitching their wagon to a star, as real or imaginary as you care to believe. They claim the skies around Warminster are littered with UFO junk, which shines on the faithful who come here from all over the world. On a clear day, they say, you can see practically anything. Strange lights of brilliant colour have been reported streaking across the sky, sometimes hovering for several minutes before disappearing into the hillside. More exaggerated claims speak of elf-like visitors coming down from flying saucers and interrupting army manoeuvres at the nearby Royal School of Infantry. But seeing is believing, say the UFO Society, and it's true that more and more people, disillusioned with life on Earth, want to believe in a force outside their understanding. For this reason, the UFO people are offering star weekends with bed and breakfast tossed in between the odd galactic happening. But the town of Warminster, which is preparing for its summer tourist season, thinks UFOs are strictly non-U. Overtures to the local Chamber of Commerce for more hotel accommodation went down with as much conviction as finding a black hole on Salisbury Plain. But undeterred, the UFO Society are fighting on. Inside a cottage they've bought and renovated for £11,000, they're hoping to whet the imagination of Star Trekkers with UFO badges, stickers, notepaper, books and T-shirts. A mass of literature is being gathered to awaken sceptical minds. Photographs of actual sightings are on display, although few of them have been authenticated. It's said that 90% of all reported sightings can be explained by natural phenomena. But what about the other 10%? Sally Pike believes she witnessed the real thing. The closest sighting I've ever had, I believe, was um, Star Hill at Warminster. And that was a really good one, you know. It was close up, or I should say about a quarter of a mile, I suppose, with a large orange globe floating across from the Stonehenge direction, right in front of about 12 of us, which, you know, who were present at the time. It was just twilight. And through binoculars, when you observe this, you could see the traditional dish shape with the sort of orange light flashing on the top, and it followed the contours of the hill at Star and came down, you know, fairly close at hand, and it sort of hovered. It was an actual beautiful shot, you know, like a, mm. as if it had posed specially for us. And um, whilst everybody watched it, the light on the top changed from the, an orange to a white, and it seemed to spin. And it, you know, it's visible there for about, oh, I think it was two minutes. 
The British UFO Society claim that people who come to Warminster in search of terrestrial phenomena feel a form of magnetic attraction which draws them here. That may be as high-flown as Martians eating mashed potato, but it certainly helps newspaper circulations. If Warminster is to become a happy holiday ground for star-struck earthlings, what's on offer? Ken Rogers, a UFO director, explains. Well, we can put you up for weekends or even weeks' holidays if you want us to. There's a shortage of accommodation in the town, hotel-wise, and here people can come and skywatch at night, come in sort of in the early hours of the morning and so on. They can also come and during the daytime and study UFO literature, uh, write, do research and so on. If I didn't see a UFO, would you give me my money back? Oh, we can't guarantee that you'll see a UFO. We can't guarantee that anybody will see anything inexplicable. But there's been so much evidence from just the local townspeople and from people from all over the country and many parts of the world who have come here and seen. And the, Warminster is the most likely place to come in any part of the country than anywhere else. And so it's up to the entire company of flying saucers, cigar-shaped objects, bright lights and supporting androids to get their little show lit up over the skies of Warminster this summer. The British UFO Society are hoping the force will be with them. It's the interplanetary traffic which singles out Warminster. For two decades, it's been haunted by the thing or things buzzing local airspace. This afternoon, it was just rain clouds. But there's nothing like a good anniversary exhibition, even if it is about the unexplained. 20 years worth of speculation and study is on show. It goes to prove that in UFO ratings, Warminster is definitely the final frontier for flying saucers and little green men. The thing was heard a long time before it was seen. During the summer of 1964, people in the district of Warminster were startled by sharp crackling noises in the sky. Then, during the summer of 1965, the thing was spotted. Here in the village churchyard of Hatesbury, the vicar, his wife and son were mesmerized for half an hour by a fiery red cigar shape in the sky. It was the first of many sightings to come. It sparked a sky watch. Space groupies with telescopes camped out. Scientists from all over the world came to study something that mostly wasn't there. The lucky ones witnessed strange sights. I was invited up here on Easter 1966 by the local journalist, who then said, come up onto Cradle Hill and on any clear night we'll guarantee you'll see something inexplicable. I thought, oh, I was a bit cynical, you know. And I came up here and lo and behold, at about 9.30 in the evening, a formation of five lights suddenly appeared in the sky, just where we are now, and appeared from nowhere from the sky and went across in that direction towards Clay Hill and then the lead one went very faster and it ended up going into what we call a base star and it went inside the belly of the thing and of course this base star wasn't a real star it was a craft and no logical explanation for that none whatsoever it wasn't the army it wasn't aircraft it wasn't a weather balloon as far as I'm concerned it's a UFO from all the books I've read I would say that uh, 99% chance that there are visitors that come here and uh, we don't know much about them. The Americans are very cagey about all these things, you know. Don't bother to look very much, so. Yeah. Not interested, no, a lot of people go out there, but they're doing family. I was in a flight to Spain one year. I went into the cockpit of the plane and I said to the pilot, have you ever seen any flying saucers? Oh, yes, they frequently fly along beside me in the cockpit. What do you know about that? And he, so, wasn't, he wasn't pulling my leg. I suppose there must be something, yeah. It's silly if there ain't. Big place, isn't it? A bit bigger than Warmer's, so there's got to be something. Are you going to be on top of the hill tonight? I doubt it. You see, I'm 81 plus, and uh, I don't do much wandering around at night like uh, I might have done if I was your age. Well, it certainly changed the life of one man the local newspaper reporter, Arthur Shuttlewood. Without reservation, he believed that someone or something was trying to make contact. 
a lot of people, when I've recapped on their stories, they've had that same sensation that they feel, they feel better, perhaps not physically, but mentally and spiritually particularly, they want to achieve something for the benefit of mankind. I don't think I ever have, you know, but would you do get going... that feeling that's inculcated in you by this experience, I think. Would it be going too far to say that you feel you've had something like a religious experience? Um, yes, I, I don't think that would be uh, exaggerating. You do, you, you seem to have a new outlook, a new mental outlook on life, and you want to help people. This is, this is most peculiar, perhaps, and uh, it's almost incredible to you, no doubt. But I felt that sensation. I wanted to see it again, and I wanted to convince whoever was on board that we weren't antagonistic and we wanted to warmly welcome them if they cared to land. And, of course, they have landed. They have landed now. A lot of people agree. The mystery of these extraordinary circles, which appeared in a cornfield at Westbury exactly two years ago, has never been explained. Circle spotters discovered the most startling example in what was becoming a puzzling summer. Beneath the White Horse at Marlborough, a formation of eight circles appeared, six of them forming what looked remarkably like a great crucifix. On the ground, Colin Andrews and his team measured finally calculating that the crucifix was just one degree out of true. That's 7.71 uh, at 45 degrees. We haven't had it before. It's very spectacular. It's very large. It's one of the largest formations we've seen. Um, and as I say, it, uh, it has all of the hallmarks of the genuine phenomenon. we are looking at a new form of energy. The vortex itself, I believe, is created by a new kind of energy, probably related to magnetism. I think the magnetic field of the planet may well be being manipulated uh, in an intelligent fashion. Um, and the evidence is beginning to support the theory that we are, there is, an intelligent a thinking behind this. Mr. Andrews claims to have been consulted by the government and the royal family about the circles. He says the circle phenomenon is building to a climax. Now he wants government money to fund further investigation. Since man conquered space travel, it seemed less and less fantastic that other beings may have been doing it too. Over the decades, there have been countless UFO claims. Strange lights in the sky, powerful force fields, even spaceships themselves. It's not surprising then that some think the circles are caused by the classic circular motion of flying saucers. The aliens may have materialized in sleek craft at the speed of light, but it was in his three-wheeler that ufologist Ken Rogers came to Wiltshire last week on his favorite holiday. A few days UFO spotting in the Wessex Triangle. He's been convinced since he was 16 that intelligent beings from another world started human life on Earth and they now return to monitor our progress. He's president of a UFO group called the Unexplained Society. But he has an explanation for the circles, that they're the marks left by alien spaceships. What you'd first see is a strange glow up in the sky. It would then come down. You may hear a strange sort of buzzing sound or, or high-pitched whine. Then it would hover and then gradually sort of, if you can imagine it, materialize into a, a, a saucer-shaped object and then gradually come down, hover, then probes would come out of the sides and probe into the crop. 
Very few UFO sightings have actually shown a convincing link with the circles, but a Wiltshire couple report seeing lights and feeling a strange force field when they walked into a circle near Silbury Hill. Basically, we had a very powerful experience whereby we found the place where this UFO or spaceship landed, and there was a strong energy there, which we could definitely feel. And when I was looking at Hannah, the whole sky went pitch black, which was, before that, a, a fiery sunset, and she became shining white light. I also saw the horizon, which was the beautiful sunset, turn pitch black, and Richard embodied in silver light. Um, also, I had a lot of heat going through my body, um, and through my arms, and it was just an incredible experience. The skeptics say even if UFOs do exist, why would they leave such obvious marks in the Wiltshire corn? There's two schools of thought here. Either they left the calling cards, letting us know that they've been here, that they are watching us. Secondly, they probably are landing in other areas as well, and it's only we actually see them when they land in, in the fully grown crop fields. Even the UFO believers are divided. Some groups say there isn't any real evidence to link them with the circles. Many of the circles have been found on or near Salisbury Plain, the site of one of the Army's busiest training areas. The Ministry of Defence admits to having damaged crops with vehicles and even helicopter rotor blades in the past. But they point out when they leave their mark, it's not in neat circles. Circles have even cropped up on army land. Today their range control officer is visiting a tenant farm on the edge of the Imba ranges. Hello, Bernard. Hello, Major. We've got some more circles out here. Yeah. Hello, Major. Hello, Major. Yes. Two years running, Bernard Elliott and his wife have woken up one morning to find their barley has been flattened. Same as they were last year. That's right. Yes, this. Yes. this year, it's been one large circle and four satellites. So not spiky like it is now. No, it's obviously no. grown up then since right. then. That's right, that's it, yes. Right. What, what's the military doing in this area? As you know, Might Bert, cause something like this. Well, we behave ourselves on your land, or we do our best to. I can't think of any military activity, and I've checked the range calendars that could have caused this, either uh, ground troops or vehicles or, um, or aircraft. I mean, this, it's really just a puzzle. If it isn't the army, Mr. Elliot reckons it's either a hoax or an alien visitor. That In? space up there is that large, and uh, if it's as big as people tell us it is, well, we can't be that naive to think that we're the only people in this universe. The Army has taken the problem so seriously, they've even used vehicles and helicopters to conduct their own experiments to confirm they're not responsible. But with the experimental airbase at nearby Boscombe Down, couldn't the circles be caused by secret radar or communication trials? I've been through the whole list of, um, of exercises and trials, and there's nothing that would... Uh, possibly produce the sort of effect that we've seen today. But they wouldn't tell you about it anyway, would they? But I know, uh, before they come on here, they have to actually tell me what they're going to do. Uh, and I, uh, I'm always at liberty to go and inspect and see what they're doing. And uh, I've seen, or I'm aware, uh, that um, the sort of equipments that have been trialled here would not produce that uh, uh, phenomenon. Even if the military is behind it, it seems highly unlikely they'd have kept it hidden for so long, even if they needed to. As for alien visitors, it still remains strange that no one's ever seen a spaceship making such obvious marks in our crops. The world's weather has fascinated and confounded man since time began. Although its mechanisms are now largely understood, it remains an untamed and sometimes mysterious force of immense power. Great wind movements like hurricanes can now be observed by satellite and their course predicted. But now there's talk of something new in the skies, an invisible atmospheric force which leaves not destruction in its wake, but beautifully formed circles. It's the theory of Dr. Terence Meaden, an independent meteorologist who's prepared to battle with the scientific establishment to get his radical new ideas accepted. 
He's the director of the Tornado and Storm Research Organization based at Bradford-on-Avon in Wiltshire. He's been an advisor to the CEGB on the effects of tornadoes on nuclear installations. And he's convinced that it's a cousin of the tornado which is descending over southern England and causing the circles. But unlike this tornado, the mass of wind is stationary and electrically charged. Dr. Meaden maintains that the circles are created by a spinning ball of air sparking with electricity. It descends, pushing the corn down and leaving a spiralling pattern in its wake. Then it recedes or simply disappears into nothing. If he's right, he's discovered a new meteorological phenomenon which challenges preconceptions about the world around us. I see a way in which it's possible that vortices can be formed in the atmosphere by natural means. Um, you can call that weather if you like. It's, it's, it's something natural in the atmosphere, I do believe. Dr. Meaden accounts for the number of circles in the West Country by the fact that we're looking harder for them. He also believes that the lie of the land creates favourable conditions for the vortices to be formed in the atmosphere. And he's worked out what it may be like to witness a circle forming. There would have been a tremendous rush of air at the stage spiraling around out from a center there and uh, accompanied I believe with a humming noise and if it happened by night possibly accompanied by a light as well but then we cannot tell whether this formed by day or by night pretty terrifying actually if you happen to be around at the time what would have happened if you probably were enough to knock you over Dr. Meaden says it's a complex electrical effect from that wind which creates the smaller satellite rings. His theory is closely argued and has won the cautious backing of a few scientists, although most weather experts remain sceptical. Dr. Meaden says his research will be completed in two years. At the moment, it's the only scientific theory available. south of England. Strange circular shapes have been appearing in the crops, particularly in the area that was once King Arthur's Wessex. Could it be that someone or something is running rings round Arthur? Everywhere you look in this part of England, there are circles, round barrows, tumuli, constant reminders of an age gone by, and the special significance which Salisbury Plain had for the early Britons and the Druids, who built their most sacred temple here in the form of a circle. Crop circles have been found as far afield as Brazil and Japan, but here in the south of England, they're being recorded at a rate of about 100 every year. There are those, however, who believe that a different form of airborne transportation is actually responsible for causing the circles. There's a lot of military activity in the area. Middle Wallop is the main base for naval helicopters. A few years ago, Colonel Greville Edgecombe was surprised to find the finger of suspicion being pointed at his pilots. A local farmer or landowner around here rang up and said, what are you chaps been up to? And I said, what? And he said, my corn. And I said, let's have a look. Trundled over and there are these extraordinary circles in his corn. And he was doing it light-heartedly, but um, quite clearly it wasn't our helicopter. Well, why was it quite clearly not your helicopter doing it? Well, when you see these, the corn is laid down in a spiral circle, and the edges all around the circle are absolutely untouched, absolutely sheer. Whereas the helicopter, the wind from the helicopter blows down and out, and the grass or the corn would be dished out in a saucer helicopter produces a wind downwards and that is not going to make an absolute sheer cut you couldn't possibly do it because the helicopter would have to even if it could make it into that spiral would have to arrive in one spot and disappear again without even moving to get a perfect circle that you end up with. It, it's absolutely impossible
So, it's unlikely that it's caused by the downdraft of a helicopter. We have a good eyewitness account from Melvin Bell, who lives in Wiltshire, and who, when riding on horseback one evening, saw such a circle being formed. This was near Bratton, and he said that the spiral circle was laid out as he watched it, and that in addition, he could see dust and debris spiraling upwards around the edges. All there was really was a, a, like a whirlwind, very much the same as you would get in a, a shopping crease and that, where rubbish just goes in a circle and comes up from the ground. And they just left a circle in the ground and really that's all there was. This is what I've been using to explain some of the more unusual properties of the crop circles. In fact, what this is representing is nothing more than the foot of a fairly conventional whirlwind. But many whirlwinds have been known to have, in addition, an external sheath. And if an external sheath of this sort also comes down to ground level, then one will get uh, simply an annular ring cut out into the crop. And is it possible that, that the outer circle would turn in a different way, would spin in a different way from the inner vortex? Uh, th that is a necessary consequence, really, of the conservation of angular momentum, that the two are turning in opposite senses. Of course, not all crop circles have an outer ring. Others, like the ones Colin Andrews showed me, have two. I mean, as far as this formation is concerned, it's only the second time uh, throughout the world that this has ever been seen. Well, that's with the, with the with two, two rings. That's right, with the two rings. But one of the things that surprises me is that this is going a different way from that band and that's from right. the band there. That's one's right. going clockwise, one's going anti-clockwise. That's, that's absolutely consistent with everything we see. These structures are a balanced entity. The other thing is, I mean, you've got the, cro the crop is standing yes. perfectly around the edge of it, isn't it? I mean, is, absolutely. is that fairly yes, common as well? Yes, it is. It's bolt upright. There is no lateral movement whatsoever. It gives very much the impression that something either from underneath or from above has pushed itself into the crop without any lateral movement whatsoever. Are there any other phenomena? There are a number of fringe phenomena events which we feel it is worthy of our time. One such event occurred on, I think, 10 days ago, just over the brow of this hill here to the southeast at Kilmerston, a village called Kilmerston. A lady there rushed out into her back garden um, after hearing an extremely loud bang to find that a galvanized water trough, cattle trough, containing about 80 gallons of water and weighing approximately half a ton, connected to an underground water pipe, had propelled itself through the air for no apparent reason without touching the ground once. Uh, the water, um, I should add, had disappeared. What explanation have you got for that? I don't, I don't, frankly, I have not got an explanation. Um, we, we are looking here at a relatively new phenomenon, a very important phenomenon. This is happening throughout the world and cries out for understanding. explanation might seem the most plausible. But why are the circles here in ancient Wessex? Could it be that the answer is hidden in the mists of time? I think Stonehenge might well have a part to play in all this, particularly with regard to this country. We noted some time ago that the dimensions of these formations were consistent with the dimensions of the circles within Stonehenge itself. Not only that, but that some of the ley lines running through and to Stonehenge also we feel may well have a part to play in the location of these things. So what secrets lie under the ancient burial mounds? How important are the ley lines? Are the magnetic fields? Or is it just an unhappy coincidence that brought the pilot of a Harrier jump jet into this area on the 22nd of October, 1987? 
Shortly after takeoff, all radio contact with the plane was lost. It was found flying without a pilot over the southern tip of Ireland and later crashed into the Atlantic. The body of the pilot was later found not far from Stonehenge. Only yards away, in the same field, were four crop circles. I was there within an hour and a half of the report of the unfortunate pilot's body being found. What were your feelings when you visited the site? Well, clearly of sadness uh, for the loss of the pilot. But uh, frankly, it sent a chill down my back, the fact that I had previously had an inner feeling when I heard of the, about the accident of the aircraft, not knowing even where it was or where it had actually taken place. I just literally had an inner feeling that there might well be some association with our phenomenon, and it turned out to be absolutely precisely so. I can't account for that. And what about the UFO that Pat and Jack Collins reported seeing one night on Stockbridge Down? As we came over the brow of the hill behind you, uh, then... You said we... to me, didn't you? Cool, look quick at that. Yeah. Uh, there was this circle with lights all around the edge and uh, would appear to have been spokes which were also lit. I saw this enormous big thing. It was like sort of looking at a great wheel at a fairground. It looked that size. Like Jack said, it was lit up the whole way round and the spoke with the clear, like electric light bulb lights and the like spokes of the wheels of this wheel and they were all lit up as well and it was standing up on end. By the sound of it, Steven Spielberg was pretty close to the mark when he made Close Encounters of the Third Kind. What did the philosopher say? Once there are more things in heaven and earth than a dream of in our philosophy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I definitely I think know. it's something... Uh, it's not from this earth. Because, as I say, I they're so... The, the way the corn is swept around in them, yeah. And, and you've got the four evenly spaced where I should think feet have come down or something uh, out on the, you, you get the great big one in the middle and you've got the four outside mm -hmm. ones. I mean, they're so evenly spaced that uh, it's got to be something like that. Talking about feet on the ground, the military kept pretty quiet about this four-legged friend. There's no doubt that some of the UFO sightings on Salisbury Plain can be put down to unmanned gadgets like this spy in the sky being tested. Astronomer and country parson, the Reverend Inge, had until recently a parish near Salisbury Plain. Mr Inge told us how he deals with people who believe these things come from outer space. Two ladies wrote to me from an address in Bristol and they said they were walking on a hill, a high hill outside Warminster, and uh, suddenly, without any warning, from a wood nearby, two of the strangest little flying machines they'd ever seen suddenly shot up into the air with a terrific noise, and flames and smoke, and they disappeared right up. The way they went over the horizon. And uh, they were so astonished that uh, they thought they must be seeing things, they didn't like to mention it. And um, they did take the trouble to sit down and write about this. And in that connection, I want to say what they saw, I'm sure, is uh, what has already been shown on film at the BBC, a film that came from the United States, of these uh, one-man helicopters that are um, jet-propelled as well. You have the rope over your head, and the man is, has it strapped on his back. And uh, I met another man later on, as I say just now, he actually saw one of these come down alongside his car and he stopped and he saw the man pull out a map, consult the map, see where he was, fold it up again, put it in his pocket, crash helmet and everything, and press the button and away he went up in a, in a sheet of flame. Now that would frighten the life out of anybody if they didn't know what it was and the stories about men coming from outer space would be almost justified in that case if you didn't know what it was. So there is nothing to worry about. After all, none of these things have killed anybody yet, or as far as I know, injured them, except perhaps the brave people that are taking part in them, and then you don't hear very much about that. But would you go so far as to encourage ordinary people to think these did come from outer space, so that the services could carry on with their experimenting behind this sort of smoke screen? Would you oh, no. Go <laughs> no, not a bit. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't that, that would be deception, wouldn't it? 
uh, I would simply say, look, you've seen something that perhaps you weren't supposed to see. I can assure you that there's no danger from it. And if you see it again, just remember that it's, it's really in your own interest and in the interest of this country that these things are happening. And just go to sleep on it and don't worry about it. So I'm, I'm personally, my uh, message to the people of Warminster is don't forget that you live on the edge, the perimeter of an experimental area where brave men are doing experiments um, in connection with all three of the forces. You're the editor of the local newsletter about UFOs. What? Um, a lot of people do say it's the army around here that are causing the Warminster thing, but we've traced back through history that cases occurring before the army came here, and also we've got cases on record of army personnel out on manoeuvres actually seeing things themselves that they can't explain. What about the answer lying in the soil? Have they examined that theory equally closely? We asked Mike Hodgson from the Soil Survey and Land Research Centre to come along to Francis Shepherd's farm in Wiltshire, where circles appear regularly, to see what he could dig up. I must say that there are many features in the landscape which are well known to archaeologists and soil scientists, uh, which are uh, based on crop marks, which are based on soil. Uh, and these are often archaeological, round barrows, things of this kind. But they're all related to either differences in soil nutrition or in soil depth. Uh, Soil depth, of course, affects the water supply to the growing plant during the, uh, during the summer season. There's still a possibility of something like that here, but my, my instinct is that perhaps there isn't. Chemical causes have been dismissed because the circles are so geometric, but fungal infections can cause fairy rings in grass. As a true scientist, Mike Hodgson took several samples before passing an opinion. Now, what I'm looking for is a bit of reaction to this acid, this one. It's going ever so slightly. What do you think causes these crop circles? This particular crop circle, I remain uh, agnostic. Certainly, certainly not little green men. Uh, I would always be in a, a soil man myself. I would always look for a terrestrial uh, cause for this. And I'd like to stress it's very often, in actually, even if it's a fungal disease, the fungal disease could be related uh, to soil. Francis Shepherd doesn't believe a word of it. The history of this field is that my family's owned it for about four generations, since the late 20s. And um, we've had a period of about 60 years without seeing any circles at all. And then 1983, rather a shortage of news in the newspapers, and um, a Daily Express reporter reported seeing a circle here early one morning from the top of the hill behind you there. And um, I've got a view that perhaps he might have made the circle for a story, because next day there was a three-page article in the Daily Express, which is a heck of a lot of lines in the national newspaper about crop circles. OK, why do you think it's a hoax? Well, because if we look into the centre over there, you'll see that that ground has been trampled down much more than on the edge, because I reckon a group of people have linked arms, walked round in a circle. The person on the edge has travelled fastest than the chap in the centre who stood on the spot. Therefore, he stood the corn down more in the centre. You, you can clearly see this. Also, I reckon it was done at night time because the people didn't want to be spotted because I'd be on their backs if they were caught. And after dark, probably a few pints of the local 6X inside them, they've lurched rather into the corn because the line is not sharp, but there's little marks where people have drunkenly swaggered out of line. We put Francis Shepherd's theory to the test. Right then, Matty, I'll go in first, then. Yeah, stick to the tram lines. We enlisted the help of a young farmer's tug-of-war team. Would it be possible, we wondered, to create a crop circle without leaving any trace of human involvement? They looked surprisingly practised as they made their way down the track left by the sprayers to the spot that we'd chosen. They were armed with nothing more than a stick and a bit of old rope. All right, let's keep this tight. Ready? Yep. Tight, Matt. Keep it tight. Go on, Andy. Four hundred. This isn't bad. 
I'm doing about three times the width of Phil. <laughs> and he's got size 11s on his own. I've heard this, that's really good. <laughs> It was roughly at this point that serious doubts crept in and all thoughts of little green men were replaced by images of large ruddy ones. Got to cover up the scorch marks. <laughs> Can you see the paper tomorrow? Another one. Needs a few final touches done to it, sort of the manicure of the surface. Yes, I yes. Well, what, what, what are you going to do to manicure it then? Well, we sort of comb it, spread the wheat out on the ground, even it up, make it look like a spaceship. You do look as though you've done it before. Well, yeah. <laughs> that I no Rent comment. Rent a circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously, have you done it before? Well, that that well, that would be telling. I, yeah. yeah, trade secrets. Yes, I, I wouldn't like to say. I think there'll be many farmers in Hampshire that might be knocking on our door. <laughs> Messrs Taylor and Andrews, however, took it all in their stride, and went about examining the hope circle just as meticulously as they do the real thing. See, uh, Basti, inside here, you've got. You see this two-inch, three-inch gap between the lie of the plant and the surrounding wall, yep. this gap here. This is something we would never find, because, of course, this is a, a concentric flow as opposed to the, the genuine phenomena. It's, in fact, in many respects, it's too perfect. perfect. <laughs> it's it is too perfectly good. circular as opposed to the uh, elliptical shape as well. You can see that this is absolutely circular. I mean, it's very neat and uh, it's very well done, but it very clearly is a hoax. Yeah. We identify very quickly those circles that are hoaxed and we have seen three this year that have been hoaxed uh, the lie of the plants uh, with a, in, within the genuine phenomenon is entirely different to anything that uh, can be hoaxed and has been hoaxed have you ever been taken in not as yet not as yet but we don't set up to be taken in we obviously uh, we are wanting to get on with the job and to break beyond this hoax nonsense uh, there is a genuine phenomenon here, one which now we have to get to the bottom of. But this one, as they say, could run and run. No matter which theory you support, whether you think it's an elaborate hoax, a stationary whirlwind, or believe in Colin Andrews' unexplained phenomenon from outer space, collecting the data to support the claim is full of frustration. It's a race against time. And just when you think you might be getting there, someone always comes along and destroys the evidence. Ken Rogers is chairman of the National Unexplained Society, which boasts 2,000 members. Yeah, wind conditions, you can understand a, a, a mini whirlwind. Farmers know what a mini whirlwind looks like in, in their fields. It's perfectly symmetrical. You only have to look, as I say before, the television pictures, the, the, the perfect circle in the middle, followed by the four outer circles outside, which is typical, as far as we're concerned, to uh, the landing and taking off of, of, of a UFO. But even the sceptics were hard put to dismiss some of the reports. In the village of Steeple Ashton, dozens experienced an encounter of the most peculiar kind. The chap here in the blue sweater, now you, you've got a good view of it. What do you think it was? Um, I think it was a spaceship. A spaceship? Yep. <laughs> was... why, why do you think that, in all seriousness? Well, it had a hole through the middle, but it was sort of hard around the edge outside. The clouds couldn't pass through the outside of it. Could go through the middle of them. Have you ever seen anything like it before? No. Nope. Not nothing like that. And how long were you able to see it? I was up in the window, I saw it about three minutes. Three minutes? Yeah. Was it sort of hovering or...? No, it was just going around like a wheel, just going over. Now, you got a good view of it. Describe it to me. Well, it was sort of a um, black, blackish grey ring going across the sky. And it was dark on one side and in the bottom it had a sort of little line through it. And it was moving across the sky slowly and then it disappeared behind a tree. Miss Green, did you see the, the phantom object yourself? I saw it, yes. Now, how would you describe it? Uh, very much as the children did, as uh, it appeared to be a, a smoke ring. That's, you know, that's the best way that I can describe it, as a smoke ring. Any theories as to what it no might be? No theories at all. None at all. 
I mean, obviously, people are going to speculate men from Mars or what have you. I mean, the, the only thing I can say really is that I'm glad there were a lot of other people saw it at the same time as I did. Down in the town, at least one group of people were over the moon, the traders. An invasion of sorts had certainly arrived, but it was of a very different kind. Not little green men, but tourists, thousands of them. If the Warminster thing wasn't exactly a put-up job, at least the town's shrewd businessmen knew a good thing when they saw it. It did wonders for trade. I'm sure the traders did some, did some business. I'm sure they did, because there were hundreds of people coming into the town, hundreds. Yes, this is a map showing all the 11 ley lines that run through Warminster. Indeed, That's UFOs difficult. were tailor-made for tourism. Because it is unique in the world for this number of ley lines crossing. This is the original photograph that a gentleman actually sent us three weeks ago. It'll see hmm, the crossing. Interest became so great, one couple even set up a UFO bed and breakfast hotel, marmalade and Martians on the menu in the mornings. The idea was an immediate success. It could only have happened in Warminster. And, of course, the Americans in particular loved it. Well, because there was a tremendous need in Warminster, and we'd, we'd heard from Arthur Shuttleworth about people knocking on his door at all hours of the day and night, all the year round, not just the summer, um, wanting to know about the hills, what he's seen, could he take them up on the hills, where can they stay the night, where the army is, and all this sort of thing. But why do you believe so strongly that there are UFOs from another planet? I've seen quite a few of them, some of them very close up. Such as? In North Wales, I've seen what I thought was a mothership about the size of a jumbo jet without wings, about as close as 300 yards, coming up a valley completely soundlessly, very large, very silvery and beautiful, and it stopped and did a complete right turn into the side of the mountain. And how close was this? This was about 300 feet above a lake and about 300 yards away, and it was midday with no clouds or anything. There's got to be other life than this tiny little planet. And um, we saw, when we came on holiday to Warminster, we saw one zigzagging over the top of us. It had a sort of bow wave in front of it, and uh, that was convincing enough. The little market town stayed in the limelight for more than a decade. It somehow became accepted as a place where the unusual was pretty usual. The very name developed a ring which in itself became evocative, Warminster. But why here? It's true the town stands on the edge of Salisbury Plain, a mysterious enough place at the best of times. Shuttlewood had his own theory. Well, we've often pondered why, but uh, it could be that it lies on the direct area route between Glastonbury, a place of mystery as you know, to, the, to our west and Stonehenge to our east. On that direct area line, is where the majority of UFOs travel. It's amazing, the number of books have been published on it. Uh, Warminster Mystery, more UFOs over Warminster, UFOs Geese in the New Age, Warnings from Flying Friends, all just about Warminster. Um, most of the UFO books you pick up now are in America. You look at the index pages and they've all got chapters about Warminster in. Incredible the amount of interest outside the town that's been created by this strange UFO phenomenon. Uh, it, it wasn't a publicity stunt, it wasn't a hoax, you were quite genuine in what well, you think you saw. There have been one or two hoaxes, yes, over the years. People have sent up lighted balloons and so on, but they haven't really sort of fooled us. And you can look back in history, in the 1920s, the local head postmaster collected folklore and legends of the area and strange stories about ghosts and poltergeists and so on because they didn't know about UFOs then because they're a modern technology thing. UFOs probably are the ghosts of modern technology. Uh, well, yes, I think there is something, but what, I don't know. Do you remember the UFOs in space? Yes, yes. Do you believe uh, in it? Um, well, I think there might be something funny about this guy and thing. There's so much in the air that you can't really tell. You sound as if you might just believe in them. Well, I don't know. There might be something in it, but I never found anything. Not myself personally. 
So you don't really think they came from outer space? Oh, no, no, not yet. I think they might later on, but not yet. Are they going to come back one day? Well, history shows that possibly that they did come back in the, uh, in the 60s because, as I say, in the 1920s, there were a strange phenomenon. And in a book called The History of Warminster, written 115 years ago, there's a whole chapter about phenomena in the town. So it may well be a recurring thing. It's just that uh, it happened in a time when we were into spaceships, um, travelling to the moon and so on, that we've used this UFO label. We've termed it them as spaceships because we're living in the space age. It's probably possibly a phenomenon that's part of this town, and always has been, uh, that re reoccurs. And depending on the time scale, like once it was called angels and demons and things falling out of the sky, and now we turn them as, um, as flying saucers. That, it must have been about eight years, or probably more. Uh, we're going towards uh, uh, Westbury to pick my son up, from, uh, from Walmans to pick my son coming on a train. I had my other son with me and it was pelting down with rain and we saw this thing coming across the sky like a cigar that had been reported and uh, we didn't believe anything probably till the next day and uh, it was reported in the press that something was sighted on the way from um, Bradford on Aden towards Froome and this was right in the flight so I mean what could you think of it well it was just a cost of living going up quicker than something you know there's nothing we could decide on, but people really do believe there is something. We have sent voyagers into space. Why can't other be people be sending them to us? No, on that basis, uh, I think there could very well be something. I'm not personally convinced, but there we are. They were sceptical when uh, certain people postulated that this Earth planet was round. They were proved wrong. The evidence shows, the weight of evidence, the files and files of it, that something definitely strange happened in this town. A few people, two or three, have come to me, or approached me, but not in any sense of worry. I have had one man who came to ask me what I thought of the thing, theologically. My answer to him was that whether or not the thing was a real thing, it did not seem to me to be relevant. Uh, to to the end of uh, the, the judgment, nor that it had any religious significance. Did you feel inclined to poo-poo what he was saying, or did you take it dead seriously? I took it seriously in the sense that he himself was dead serious, and uh, uh, to that extent I, 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 I had respect for what he said. But uh, this attitude is one which I find personally very difficult to cotton on to, because I don't think that, speaking theologically, that, 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 that God works in these ways. Whenever I come to Warminster now, I'm always reminded of an American television film about a little town in the States where the people were perfectly normal by day, but come the night, they became zombies, taken over by aliens from outer space. Well, Warminster folks certainly look as if they're controlling their own lives, UFOs take the vari-coloured shapes of glowing spheres, luminous pear drops, ovular jewels that range from blood-red rubies to winking diamonds of flashing lights, from lustrous daytime pearls of shimmering surface to fiery emeralds that create the nocturnal heavens with fluorescent brilliance. Wow! But people were seeing or hearing strange things. I just suddenly said, um, there's a light up in the sky. He rushed out to get his little telescope. So we all had a glance, and sure enough, there was a shining object. Well, having investigated this phenomenon uh, for the past three or four years, my principal conclusion is that it is due to an object coming into our atmosphere from outer space. It was like a cigar, like a big cigar just going up along the sky. You sure of that? Well, I got two daughters that I swear on their, on their lives. It would seem that E.T. or whoever else was involved has gone home. There are those who are convinced it was the military, testing devices on Salisbury Plain, just a hand grenade's throw from Cradle Hill. This is how one writer described the UFOs. Seen through a telescope at night, a hovering spacecraft is a glorious firefly of radiating color changes pulsating from center to outward edges in a continuous stream of patterns, white, amber, green, and red. 
well, cynics like me might say, just like the flashing lights of a military helicopter. Ah, well, all part of Warminster's history. Or is it? Mr and Mrs Payne saw the thing late one night when they were returning to Warminster on Mr Payne's motorbike just before they were married. Well, we saw these massive uh, sort of discs appear from a clump of trees. And um, I said to my... He was my boyfriend then. Good heavens, what on earth is that? And, of course, the bike had broken down, you see. And he said, well, I have no idea. So we stood there looking at it, you know, bigger and bigger and came towards us. We absolutely just struck down. We didn't know what it was. A few miles outside Warminster is the Elizabethan mansion of Longleat. Nigel Mingay, the son of Lord Weymouth's butler, describes the thing as it came his way. Well, I was out one night and uh, a friend who I know, who lives just across the road, he said he'd seen it. Well, I didn't believe him, but uh, he told me to come out, so I went out with him and we walked around for about half an hour. And then uh, we were sort of looking round the sky the whole time, hoping to see it. We were just on the verge of coming in when we saw it, and it went right across the horizon. Yes, and where did it go exactly? Well, if I can show you just out here, it appeared from behind this tree and went right over the sky and disappeared just before it got to that tree. And what did you feel like when you saw it? Well, I was surprised, not shocked, but I always had an open mind about it. But now I believe in it. How many other Warminster people believe in it? Or perhaps we ought to say, how many Warminster people are willing to confess that they believe in it? So far as we can judge, there seem to be believers, disbelievers, and don't knows in about equal proportions. And quite a number of people in each category appear to be more than a little worried about the whole business. The story ricocheted round the world, for example, after the um, first big sighting of the Ariel Cigar, which was to the south there, and that was by the vicar and his family of Hatesbury, uh, 17 young people at Warminster, the hospital physiotherapist, Miss Long, the Horlocks, who described two flaming red pokers, which is rather graphic, of course, but I could see what they meant. Having seen the thing myself now, I think I can see what they meant by that description. Now, would you tell us exactly what you did see? Well, I saw... Uh, this will always be indelible on my mind because... Um, it was 3.42 p.m. on the last Tuesday, that's September the 28th, the last Tuesday in September. And I was going upstairs, we, we live in rather a high up flat over Monumental Masons. They call us death row, incidentally, because we have the hospital, doctors, undertaker, and then we're the Monumental Masons next door. Uh, but apart from that macabre observation, um, I went upstairs and I was completing a story for a magazine which is coming out in April on a woman lion tamer who can also tame uh, all sorts of jungle cats in the same cage. Uh, Mary Chipperfield, you've probably heard of her. And I went up for my notes, but my attention was arrested by this huge cigar shape in the sky. Now, had I normally been walking underneath that, I'm sure it would have assumed the proportions of nothing but a dense white cloud. But from the angle of vision that I had from the top of our house, I could see a peculiar hump uh, uh, a yellow or an amber burnished protrusion from the top and I'd never seen anything like this in all my life and it was nine months after the this thing started and I, 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 don't, I honestly don't think I've been conditioned to all that extent although I've lived in the center or the vortex of this mystery we, we, let's face it it is a mystery uh, but I wasn't convinced even uh, in spite of the, the high caliber of witnesses I wasn't convinced that this thing existed but I, I saw this with my own eyes I dashed straight away for a camera. I got the camera lined up, and the setting was, was about eight. It was a beautiful, clear afternoon. Out of the window, this thing came along over Colloway Clump, which is over there, northwest to southeast, gliding along a gentle giant in the sky. Um, I trained my camera on it, and I felt the camera jumping about in my hands. That was the first uh, unusual aspect. Uh, it didn't frighten me, but I felt like sharp prickling ne needles down that side of the hand, the wrist, that side of the face, and my eye watered for two months afterwards on that side. That was the exposed side to this thing. Now that proved to me that whatever was on board, or whoever was on board, could see me, could see this apparatus of mine, 
it, it threw out some concentrated force field, I'm quite serious about this, which deliberately, with the deliberate intent of gumming up the camera. And, of course, they succeeded because nothing developed from 25 feet of film except an 8 feet portion burnt right through. That's all I had on my camera. If the, they're trying to make a major impact, yes. one would think they wanted all possible publicity. Why should they want, then, to gum up the camera? Well, I think uh, the reason that struck me at the time, my wristwatch, incidentally, stopped. I didn't, didn't notice that until afterwards. Um, I think that... I don't think that they're so worried, perhaps, about photography, but if they're thousands of years advanced, uh, from, you know, uh, over us, and they've learned perhaps thousands of years ago to outlaw war. And you notice that the heaviest sightings of these people on this earth are just preceding a world war or some um, nuclear experimentation, some danger threshold, shall we say. Uh, if that's the case, and they saw the camera there, what's to prevent them being at no more than half a mile up at that time, I'm sure, thinking automatically, here's one of those crazy earth men and he's got a gun on us. I think that that's, it's a fear uh, that they have that I might have opened up on them, you know, with a machine gun, for all they knew. I think that uh, that's why they gummed up. There's no shortage of people who've seen peculiar sights and heard peculiar sounds. Mrs. Head's got the most vivid recollections. I was woke up really out of me swat sleep I had by this noise. First of all, it was like hail. And then it got nearer onto the roof, and it was like a lot of cats scratching, or like an aerial scratching about, you know, up there. And then uh, I thought to myself, well, what on earth is that? I got, I, I let in bed for quite a while, and I got quite hot, I got panicky, you know. So I did venture, and I paid a bed. And I looked out of the window, and there wasn't a drop of rain, it was all dry, everything was as dry as a bone. But after that went over, I heard a whimpering noise and like someone going, ah, that was the noise it was. And I thought, so whatever is it? And I sat on the side of the bed, pushed jeans in with me, and she said, whatever's the matter with you? I said, do you hear that noise? She said, no, nothing, don't wake me up. She went to sleep again. So the dog downstairs, she didn't bark, but she was making that woofing noise. You know, woof like they do. And... Uh, Afterwards, when I turned over on my side and I got into bed, it looked as though there was a light, like the cloud going over a moon. I don't know whether anything passed over then, but there was no planes, nothing at all in sight. I pull the blankets up over my head and think, damn the army, I wish they'd shut up and go to sleep. In bed or out, Miss Anderson has both feet right on the ground. She's no intention of being taken in by any talk of visitors from other planets. Last summer, I got up one morning, looked out of my bedroom window, and uh, we had got army in green camouflage jackets with leaves in their steel helmets romping around the, the estate yard and the um, withy beds beyond. You could call those little green men, I suppose. Now, what do you think about this uh, general mystique that's developed about these objects around here? Um, I think it's a pity that so many people are ready to make categorical statements about a thing that nobody has bothered to investigate. As far as I have been able to discover, there has been no coordinated observation, no scientific inquiry as to what's happening. Various individuals have seen various things and have immediately drawn their own conclusions. Well, if there's anything going on in brackets kind of thing, I'd like to know what it is. If there's any nice little men about, spares, sort of from Venus, Mars, anywhere, have them come here by all means. I mean, we'd like to know them. And if it's giving people something to talk about, we'll bring trade to the town, fair enough, go on with the whole thing. So we continued to watch it for a while, and then it started this very erratic movement again. So I said, is it the star? And he said, no, it isn't. And then he believed, as well as uh, me, that there was definitely something around. I believe in it because uh, whereas those who haven't seen it don't believe it, those who have seen it must believe in it. Uh, it's as simple as that. Those who see, believe. Those who don't see, scoff.
I don't believe them. I just don't believe in it at all. I think there's there's a there's something that's um, it's not proved. I just don't believe they exist until they are actually proven as a thing. You know, I mean, they can show photos, but I think there's something to explain it all. But this is a fact. I have seen it. Oh, I have seen it too. As a matter of fact, we're coming over the plane one night. Uh, we were travelling rather fast. They just overtaken so my wife said, stop, stop. Well, it appeared to be round to me. But um, my husband was driving rather fast and he wouldn't stop to have a look at it. So and then when we got home, she explained to me this is the thing she had seen herself before and she wanted me to stop to see it. But I myself have only seen the movement of it from terrific distance at terrific speed. That's all I can tell her. And I firmly believe in it. It doesn't bother me. I'm a Christian. I don't care about it at all. Have you seen anything else since? Yes, I have seen it once, or oh, I think a few months later, as I was looking out of one of my back windows. It was Did above it... the trees, and that, then it was swaying. Did it look the same? Yes, it did. It had the red light as well as the previous one. Mm -hmm. What sort of shape did it have? Well, it looked uh, brown. <laughs> you can't really describe it. Just between those two bungalows, over there, I saw this thing, and it was very bright white, but it was sort of dome-shaped, you know, like a saucer. Mrs. Atwell, a pilot's wife, had a most moving experience, after which she'll never feel quite the same again. The noise woke me. Tell me about The droning noise. They were like sound waves. Never heard anything like it before. Never. Loud? Oh! Terribly loud. That's why I can't understand why my neighbours didn't hear it. Because I'm not a light sleep. Uh, I, I sleep soundly. And none of your neighbours heard no. this? No. Even my little boy was fast asleep. I went in to see him. I was too frightened, really, to think. I shall never forget it. It was about here, in this direction. I live over that way. And uh, it'd be about um, uh, 500 feet high, I should think. Very bright and very white and obviously um, metallic. I didn't see any lights on it, but it was the noise which frightened me. It was a terrible, high-pitched droning sound. I, I just, I just don't know how to describe it because I've never heard anything quite like it before. John, what sort of things have you seen in the past? Well, since I've been here, it's, it's 1969, I've seen a lot of things from this area here, Cradle Hill. Uh, mainly orange pulsating objects. A couple of years ago, when the spasm started, I've seen things coming over here from the north here and from the east here. Um, quite good objects, very low pulsating orange globes of light. Definitely not aircraft. Um, apart from these objects and the white pulsators, which are quite numerous here, I have seen a landing at Star Hill, which consisted of three revolving lights coming there. Yes, on August the 27th, 1969, I saw two points of light in South Wales coming this direction. I'm not wholly convinced that they were UFOs, they were merely points of light, but they zigzagged and they did appear from maps, they appeared to be coming towards Warminster. Other people saw rather spectacular things on this hill that night. They saw two objects. They sought them here. They sought them over there. They sought the things over there. They sought them everywhere around here. Some of them thought they even saw them. But others had rather different views. It's the beer around here. What? You mean it gives people thoughts. hallucinations? Yeah. <laughs> I saw a big ball of fire go across. From the, coming from the camp way towards Froome. They came from Boscombe down. Air ballooned with the doofers on. A public meeting chaired by the then council leader, Emlyn Rees. Pandemonium. There were hundreds of people there. It was scheduled to start at half past seven. I had a message about quarter to six saying I ought to do something about it and get down to the town hall because people couldn't get in. And I had great difficulty myself at about quarter past seven to get into the meeting. 
was going in very well, in full swing, and the post office brought in this telegram. Investigations completed. Invasion fears unjustified. Carry on, Emlyn. Signed, Doctor Who. Of course, this was quite a relief at that time, and of course, everybody burst into fits of laughter. I had an innumerable amount of letters, um, a lot from the United Kingdom, but a vast number from America, and quite sensible letters. Um, and I replied to them all, and I've had quite a lot of correspondence in the intermediate years. I've had nothing in the last five or six. It's died its natural death. Warminster Society did spawn the British UFO Society, tenaciously scanning the heavens today. Back in town, traffic still flows, earthly mortals still shop, but the cash registers do miss those heydays. I keep an open mind. Mm. Why Warminster? Your guess is as good as mine, but let's have another one soon. So, whether some people saw the thing or not, the traders of Warminster would certainly like it back soon. Please, before the army shoot it down. I hate to say this, it sounds a bit big-headed, but I've seen dozens of them. And I've been quite convinced in my mind, you know, that these are not just satellites, they're not just roving planes or helicopters. These do extraordinary things, manoeuvres that nothing that we know can do in Earth concepts. You've seen them here behind you on the side of Cradle Hill? Here, uh, over the copse there, over an ancient Iron Age settlement and fort there, beyond us here at Clay Hill. I've seen them in this vicinity for the last six years. All those years ago, someone else moved to Warminster, drawn by the unexplained happenings around the town. This face on the hillside in 1966 was Ken Rogers, and time hasn't altered his views. Same man, same place, 19 years later. Was it all just mass hysteria? Ken Rogers doesn't think so. He says his time wasn't wasted, and he still believes there's something about Warminster. You actually moved to Warminster because of the UFOs? Yes, I felt that at the time that there were things happening. The authorities and the scientists weren't taking seriously enough. I came down here and I interviewed lots of the local uh, witnesses. And that convinced me, I think, more than anything. And the really down-to-earth local people. I had nothing to gain from sort of lying or imagining these things. And they all sort of told a similar story. Strange noises on rooftops, followed by uh, sightings of fiery cigar-shaped objects in the sky. Not just... Uh, there were all sorts of people that saw these things. Um, local vicar and his wife, the hospital physiotherapist, the head postmaster. So what sort of things did you actually see then up here on Cradle Hill? Looking back, I remember seeing shimmering orbs of light in the sky, silver discoids. Um, things called amber gamblers, things that uh, orange lights that suddenly would appear in the sky and would gamble along before suddenly turning off at right angles and disappearing into thin air. You were convinced? Amazing. I was actually convinced that, and, and probably still am convinced, that Warminster in the 60s was invaded by either extraterrestrials or visitors from interdimensions. I mean, the evidence alone shows that something strange was happening. Up on the hill, Arthur Shuttlewood was convinced something was happening. He gathered dozens of reports from local people, ordinary folk who, in the words of one observer, were not easily given to flights of fancy. Or were they? Shuttlewood, a former policeman, had no doubts. Uh, the figures, um, they're rather round-headed, very tall, between seven and eight feet tall. They appear to have no necks, the joint straight down onto the shoulders long gangling limbs uh, and you don't see any features but you see the solid outline of the figure the entity if you like and the rest the interior part is transparent you're suddenly aware that they're there as though sometimes as though they've been riveted there but in an invisible form crazy sounds crazy of course it sounds crazy uh, but they suddenly appear and if you shine a torch on them you know, you're rather agitated by the sheer height of these figures. They're quite terrifying, really. You shine a torch on them, and they disappear. 
absolutely dematerialized. And then they come up closer to you, which is, again, frightening. I've had the back of my jacket tugged several times up here. And I've suspected practical jokers, you know, because we do get jokers, obviously, in this subject. But most people are serious about it. And you look around, nothing, nobody at all. The watch went on, but many of the locals remained unimpressed. If there was an answer, they had it, murmuring darkly of the military goings on round Salisbury Plain and the secret experimental aircraft establishment at Boscombe Down. Heaven alone knew what they got up to over there, but Shuttlewood knew better. I think that originally they came from some planet about three million years ago, this one cosmic surveying race, and they begat man in the image that they then were. So they come back with parental concern now to view us every now and again. But not everyone felt comfortable with Warminster's new reputation. If you were a Warminster person, then you went away anywhere. Um, and someone said to you, where do you come from? And you said, Warminster. They uh, expected you to have horns <laughs> and look green. Um, we did, personally, I did get quite a lot of leg pulling when I met people away from Warminster. Uh, they, they just didn't believe what was going on, and they thought it was all a great joke. The majority of people I met while I was away. But there were a lot of very sensible people. It wasn't just nuts or cranks who saw these things, was it? Oh, no, no. I think they definitely saw things. Um, what they were, I wouldn't know. And that's what the investigation is. then and now, I suppose, UFOs. See, the trouble with this area is you get army helicopters. We've invented this very uh, basic UFO detector. And what it is, is we have it pointing, it's like a compass. We have it pointing at magnetic north. And it's connected to a buzzer. And then set it up on sky watches, switch it on. And then should a UFO come over emitting any electromagnetic frequencies, the compass needle will get affected and it set off an alarm giving us some indication that something may be in the area, and uh, we look up and hopefully may see something. They seem to come over from over there, yeah. They come over and they sort of go in different sort of shapes and stuff, come over in different colours and stuff like that. I mean, I've come here a couple of times with been military operations on, and they say they don't come around then, so... But I believe one day I'll see one. Well, I've been up there several times and I've never seen anything. Well, I don't know. There's been quite a few sightings, especially over towards uh, that side of the area. Uh, mm. It's a bit area up there, anyway. Oh. I was walking from Arn Hill up to Cradle Hill, and then just uh, past the farmhouse, oh. I became aware of this grey thing lying in the road, and I was just absolutely dead scared. You know, it was just this fear. It was just like a fog, really, but it was perfectly outlined. It was the typical classical flying saucer that you see in photographs and so on. And it just lay there right across the road. And I, mean, I just went absolutely hot. And I, I, I didn't know what to make of it. It was similar to like Doctor Who's TARDIS, if like it was half here and half not, as if it was in another dimension. But it's an incredible experience. And I don't expect people to believe unless it happens to them. Have you made up your mind yet? Or are you like me, totally confused and mystified? I just don't know. Anyway, I think somebody's trying to tell me something. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.